All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. It's good hello. to see folks here. I appreciate you being here. Uh, my name is Chris Godsey. I work at Menace Peacemakers, where I am the program director for the Domestic Violence Restorative Circles program. I've been doing that work for about a year and a half. And it's the outgrowth of work I started doing at the domestic abuse intervention programs, uh, co-facilitating batter, battering intervention uh, group critical dialogue with men who use violence against women. Um, during the, that time, the 10 years that I did that work at DIP and, and now, uh, most of what I know about domestic violence, specifically men's violence against women, comes from that direct work with men, uh, but also from learning, uh, learning from women who have survived and are surviving men's violence, and folks who are advocates for women who are survivors. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm really grateful to have uh, Heather Dries from Safe Haven and Cami and Frazado from VIP here today. Um, I asked them to join us to, to answer a huge question, uh, to give us the response to a huge question. And that question is, um, what has been different in the advocacy work you do? And what have you seen be different for violent survivors um, since the onset of COVID in March of this year? Um, I acknowledge to them that that's a, that's a big question and responses to it can go in a bunch of different ways. And I'm hoping that in the relatively short time we have, we're gonna chat until about 2.30 or 2.35 and then take questions if there are any, and I'll stop recording at 2.45. In that relatively short time, I'm hoping that a lot comes up uh, and that some questions are answered for people, but that folks also get a sense of exactly how complex um, these problems and, and issues are. Um, I have just a couple more comments before I start asking other people to talk. Uh, the, the first is that um, Jennifer Davey from uh, Dabinugan Shelter at uh, the American Indian Community Housing Organization was also scheduled to be here today, but she emailed just a few minutes before this meeting to say that there was a, um, an emergency that she had to attend to uh, related to work, and she knows that she can pop on the call anytime, uh, and I let her know that we would miss her voice and perspective during this conversation. I should also say that this uh, this chat is part of a series in which I'm asking the same question of um, folks who have multiple jobs that put them in contact with people who have used violence and people who are surviving violence. A couple weeks ago, I talked to three people who co-facilitate battering intervention groups for DIP. Next week, I'll be talking to Arrowhead Regional Correction and Probation Officers, Dina Olson and Steve Borg, about the work they do. And I'm trying to line up a fourth conversation. Um, all the conversations will be recorded and ultimately be available on the Menace Peacemakers website and social media platforms. Um, and the whole program is funded by a St. Louis County COVID Relief Fund grant. Uh, I just want to express appreciation uh, for the opportunity to do, to do this work based on those funds. Um, so that's all the preamble I have to say. Um, before I ask Jen, uh, sorry, before I ask Cammy and Heather to answer that giant question, Cammy and Heather, could you both just um, say whatever you would like to say about um, the work you do and what brought you to doing the work? Just so we have a little bit of context for the answers you, you give later. Um, I can go first. I've been employed by the Domestic Abuse Intervention Program for about... I think about two years now. Um, I've been previously part of their focus groups and panels in the past because I was um, a recipient of their services. And um, now my involvement with DAP is um, advocacy and doing what would be group for women if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic. But otherwise, I've been associated with DAIP for um, probably almost 17 years. So I've been with Safe Haven for um, about 14 years now. And if you would have asked me 14 years ago um, if I would still be doing this work, I would have probably told you no at that time. But once I started this work, um, and seeing, you know, just 
the, the wide reach of individuals that domestic violence impacts, I just felt really compelled that I needed to continue to this, do this work in some capacity. And um, you know, there's, there's always changes that we wanna see to improve um, safety for victims and holding individuals accountable and hopefully getting you know the help they need you know to to live a life to not use violence and for survivors not to have to live a life experiencing violence um, but ultimately why I do this work is that victim survivors need somebody in their corner they need somebody who is not judge judgmental somebody to be with them through every step of the way regardless regardless of the decisions that they make um, leaving a violent relationship or figuring out how to leave a relationship that is um, violent, it, it's, it's hard. And there's tons of barriers and lots of things that have to align for that individual to successfully leave. Um, and if we can be there with them along that journey and this, you know, support person in their corner, um, you know, that ultimate, they deserve that. And um, I'm inspired to do that still. Thanks uh, very much, both of you. Um, one thing I intended to do before asking you to in introduce yourselves was just uh, set some context for the need for advocates uh, in specifically in the city of Duluth. And I actually think it works well after hearing you both talk about um, some of what you do. Um, as I told you folks before I started uh, recording the meeting, uh, Metis Peacemakers is currently in a grant writing process. and. Uh, as part of that process, I sought some information from both the City of Duluth Attorney's Office and the St. Louis County's Attorney's Office. Um, City of Duluth charges misdemeanor domestic assaults. Uh, and I learned that in 2019, they charged 168 misdemeanor domestic assaults. In 2020, they charged 111. Uh, St. Louis County charges felony domestic assaults. And just in the city of Duluth in 2019, they charged 201. And in 2020, so far, they've charged 202. Those are charged assaults. Um, so incidents that got reported and, and resulted in charges. Uh, those of us who work in this field know that that's uh, probably a relatively small sliver of the actual violence that's happening. Uh, in Duluth, uh, we acknowledge that um, people in all sorts of uh, relationships use and survive violence, um, but the, the vast majority of the week we, work we do is uh, working with uh, cisgendered heterosexual women who have had violence used against them by cishet men. Um, we don't mean to dismiss violence that's used by anyone against anyone else. It's just the reality of what we, of what we see. Um, so there's a great need for the work that Heather and Cami and uh, Jen uh, Dabanugan and their colleagues do. Uh, and my anecdotal experience uh, and the work I do at Menace Peacemakers suggests that that work has been um, impossibly complicated by, by COVID-19 and the requirement for people to keep a distance from each other that has resulted from it. So the, the question, and um, whichever one of you wants to wants to go first, please, please do. If, if you need direction, you can maybe just go in alphabetical order. Um, so the question is, um, how has COVID-19 affected the work you do? And how have you seen it affect women who are surviving or who have survived violence? And please take that any direction you'd like to. Yes, what I've seen is the women, the, the need for advocacy certainly has not gone away. I mean, in fact, it has increased in, in, in my opinion, in my experience over these months. Um, women feel like they have less resources. In fact, when, they, when this first started, in the first months of the pandemic began, women didn't even think that they had any resources or some of them or places to go. So they were not communicating the violence that they were experiencing. They were not reaching out. Then when they did reach out, they had no idea what was left that would be able to help them stand on their feet, whether they had planned to stay with an abuser or whether they were planning on leaving an abuser. 
Um, they didn't know if there were groups that they could talk to for strength and for encouragement. And they really, they didn't feel like they had a lot of options or places to turn. In fact, some of them went back to the abusers because they were afraid of being in shelters or they, they didn't know if their kids would get sick from being in the shelters. There was a lot of, there was a lot of fear out there um, that I was hearing about from the women. Um, they were just having a hard time overall trying to figure out their path. And without knowing that there was advocacy for them to tap into, it was like, where do they go? What do they do? you know when COVID started we made the commitment that we were gonna you know stay open um, and continue to provide services in some way um, that was still safe but like uh, Cam, Cam you referenced a lot if that took some time for victim survivors to even know that we were still open and still um, providing services you know so at our, sh our shelter never shut down um, it stayed open we were able to partner with a hotel to um, kind of uh, uh, some space for residents so they had some individual space to feel safe to come in um, but that fear was still there you know about uh, community transmission or anything but um, we stayed open um, continue to accept people on a rolling basis and here at our resource center um, you know our whole model here is to provide a community for victim survivors and to bring uh, support services on site, other agencies, um, and really provide some kind of wraparound support for victim survivors. And of course, when COVID started, you know, that all kind of stopped because of everyone's internal agency policies. And then again, just for the safety of any individuals. Your, your audio just went out. We, we lost it right after individuals. Can't hear you now. Well, while Heather's getting her audio back, I just want to remind folks that um, we, we will have time for folks to turn mics on and a ask questions in, uh, in a little bit. But please also feel free to type questions in the chat window if you need to or would like to. I'll try again. Sorry about that. That's frustrating. I've, I've, there have been multiple other folks who have had that happen on Zoom calls I've been part of this week. Um, Please take whatever time you need to, to get it back. Still can't hear. No. All right, can other folks hear? Cami, can you hear Heather or, or are you not? You can't hear. Okay. Okay, thank you, Pat. <clears throat> That's frustrating. So Heather, um, please keep doing what you need to do. Uh, you can log off and, and come back in if you need to. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Cami another question and I'll keep track of it for you too. Um, so that one of the things I've learned from working with men who use violence and working with women who have survived it and are surviving it is that uh, isolation can be a, a really powerful tactic. And Heather just mentioned the word community. Um, thanks for your perseverance, Heather. All right, I've logged in on my phone. Hopefully that's better. Nice. So I, I'll I'll pause my question. Um, do you remember where you were? Do you want to do you want to keep going with what you were saying? Um, where was I? I'm not sure where I cut out. You were talking about wraparound services. I had in my because I'm taking notes just because that's who okay. I am, so. okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. Pat. Yeah, so, you know, our goal is for these wraparound kind of, you know, supportive services and, you know, with COVID that stopped, but we continued to provide our core services and be open for individuals who needed to come in in crisis because we know for many victim survivors that um, accessing services remotely or at their home, it's just not safe and possible. Um, and so, you know, we've heard tons of things um, 
from the individuals we work with about how COVID, is, COVID has impacted, you know, their ability um, to access services. You know, one situation that sticks out in my mind is um, we had an individual who um, her partner was laid off and now was home all the time. And he literally kept such a close contact um, on her that she wasn't able to reach out um, and communicate with us. And so um, the only time she was able to was, you know, when she went to the bathroom or took a shower, she kind of snuck phone calls and text messages to us. Um, when he'd go out for a cigarette or take out the garbage, she'd make a quick call or something. And, you know, we just had this general understanding that if the phone hung up, um, she was okay. Um, it's just that he walked back in the room. Um, or, and then we had a code word also developed for her that if it wasn't safe, you know, we had developed that safety plan with her. So, you know, just even kind of reaching out to access services had its own list of barriers with COVID. Um, We've also heard from a lot of survivors that the types of abuse and the severity of the abuse increased as kind of COVID set in. Um, the stress of losing jobs, the cut in hours, uh, the stress of the dynamics, maybe their kids were home, distance learning now. And so we heard from multiple people that, you know, the abuse escalated to, like we even had a couple of individuals talk about how, um, you know, it was just a lot, a lot of verbal, emotional, and then it kind of crossed that threshold into physical violence because of the extra stressors added from COVID. Um, uh, victims have talked about um, uh, substance use increasing or individuals developing substance abuse issues because of all those, those same dynamics. And of course we know, uh, you know, that doesn't cause violence, but it definitely impacts um, how violence are used or how often it is used. And so um, that became a real big safety concern for individuals. Um, you know, we've just had to get real creative um, with how we were outreaching and meeting the needs um, for survivors because we knew the need was out there. Um, this summer was one of the busiest summers we've experienced in the last few years. Um, so there definitely was an increase. And when individuals found out we were opening, you know, they were reaching out and accessing services in different ways. Um, we, you know, we're doing a lot of things remotely, um, you know, text messaging and um, doing some web meetings when safe. So in a sense, we've also found a way to be, you know, probably a little bit more victim centered, you know, if it was going out to somebody's house to get a signature for an order for protection or, um, you know, just kind of meeting the victim where they're at. If it was easier for them to be at home and safer for them to be at home and complete a protection order, you know, that's what we did for them because we knew that was safest and easiest for them. Um, So uh, the, some of the examples Heather just gave uh, talk about the types of isolation I was, uh, was in the process of asking about while, while she was um, solving a technical issue. Um, I'm curious about both, um, if you have other examples of her perspectives on how isolation as a tactic of abuse has been different or enhanced or you know, changed in character in some way during COVID, but also um, what it's helped you see about the importance of community in helping survivors um, in, the, in the way you do. So have you, have you seen anything specific with isolation and um, have, you, have you learned anything that you maybe didn't notice before about the importance of community for survivors? I think COVID in itself <laughs> caused isolation, you know, um, and just kind of compounded that the isolation and the barriers that were already, already there. Um, one of the things we have worked a lot with victims about are actually with those who um, are no longer in an abusive relationship, but the whole isolation dynamic kind of triggered their uh, PTSD from the abuse that they experienced and how they identified the isolation they felt because of uh, COVID comparable to the isolation they experienced when they were um, in their abusive relationship. And so, um, you know, it. I think it goes back to as soon as that sense of community is gone or some support systems or, you know, the 
the kind of lack of ability to access different support services also played a role into individuals' healing journeys. I think women too were feeling more isolated because you know it goes back to that piece of was help available and so I think some of their partners used uh, from what I saw or heard what, they used that as a way to say who's going to help you there's no help available to you and so it just furthered their isolation. So one of the one of the questions I've been asked uh, most most frequently um, by people who know the field I work in um, is have have you seen rates of domestic violence increase during COVID? Um, and I've seen a lot of think pieces and reporting pieces, you know, since the very early days of of being affected by the pandemic that give statistics and and talk about that. And I think it's an important question. It makes sense to me why especially people outside this movement would ask it. So I'm definitely curious about whether you have seen an increase in the need for services. I'm also interested in what you think the important questions are that people aren't asking about the effects of COVID on um, violence users and violence survivors. I'm sorry, I'm doing something to you I did to students when I was a teacher. I'm asking long, multi-part questions. So I'll, I'll break that one up into its two parts. Um, are you actually, have you seen an increase in the, in the need for, for services? Is it, is it, I mean, Heather sort of answered that, said Safe Haven's had its busiest summer, but if you could talk more at length uh, about what you've seen in terms of how often it's happened. Sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It seems like um, the women that I've been working with have needed more of a variety of services. Um, one example of that was a woman who um, she could not find a place to put down even temporary roots. She had left her partner at a um, visitation exchange. He had been abusive and she didn't have anywhere to go. And she had left with clothes on her back. Uh, she's now established in an apartment uh, and we did a lot of work with her and it hasn't been um, it hasn't been that she's wanted to do like group but she's wanted those individual phone calls and individual you know the individualized support that was necessary to help her situation specifically uh, and, and like I said it was a broader sort of broader sort of assistance that she needed. And I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but it just, it seems, it seems like along the lines of, of the, the broader support, it isn't just, it isn't just like it used to be like helping a woman prepare for thinking about what she's going to say to her attorney or something like that. It's, it seems more like, when that woman left, it was the need for clothes. It was a need for shelter. I mean, all those things are there for women, but hers was intensified because of the pandemic. Like she couldn't find anything because of the pandemic. At least prior to that, you know, you're, we, she, a woman could reach out for resources and feel like that she would have those resources more available to her quicker. But this woman, she didn't know what to do or where to go. And so it seemed like, um, for me, I felt like I was wearing more hats until I could figure out, you know, where to direct her and how people were um, functioning in what capacity and what groups and, and whatnot. Thanks. Heather, do you want to, do you want to respond to that? And then I'll, um, I'll uh, get Jen caught up and give her a chance to introduce herself and answer some of the questions you've been talking about. Yeah, so I think here at Safe Haven, we definitely saw an increased um, request for service. Um, you know, in one respect, I wouldn't say that like arrests or police calls increased. Um, you know, I think a lot of victims were hesitant to go that route because it wasn't going to meet their you know, needs that they were really looking for and not knowing how the system was operating. Of course, they still did, you know, if it was an emergency situation. But we saw a lot of 
individuals reaching out for the things that Cami kind of identified. You know, all of those barriers and needs that they needed prior to COVID were all there, but finding the resources and being able to successfully get those things were like 10 times harder to get or to navigate um, because of, you know, agencies maybe closed down a little bit or um, just not being readily available or, and especially some of the like uh, support service things to, to navigate that. Um, so we, you know, we definitely kind of changed how we had to do advocacy to, um, like, again, like Cammie said, put on different hats to help them even get some of those basic needs because it was 10 times harder. Hi, Jen. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> oh, please don't apologize. We, we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Um, so I started off, um, before I asked Heather and Cammy any questions, I just asked them to introduce themselves and talk, talk about what what they do in their professional positions and, and what led them to that work. Could you share a little bit about that information about yourself? Um, sure, I am Jen Davey. I'm the house manager for ACO's uh, Dabanugan Domestic Violence Shelter. Um, I've been working in the DV field for almost 10 years, I think. Heather, you might know. <laughs> um, I think it's 10 years, um, or just about. So what led me to it is um, uh, I did my internship at an organization and got hired on there. I think I chose to do my internship in that um, due to you know growing up experiencing some domestic violence in my house. And um, my mom utilized those services and uh, saw how it helped her and the difference it made in our lives. And um, so here I am <laughs> doing you. what I do. <laughs> so the, the big question that I started with um, sort of led in to the question that um, Cami was uh, answering and then Heather answered when, when you came in. So the big one is, um, how has COVID changed the work you do? And how have you seen it change the lives of survivors and what they're going through? Um, and then the, the follow-up question was, have you seen an increase in the need for services? And that's what they were both responding to. So um, how has it changed things for you? How have you seen it change things for survivors? And is more, is more stuff happening? Um, for me, for staff in our um, shelter, everything can change. Um, it is, you know, I, I think initially, like everybody, you know, right away was like, oh, we're going to see these increase in calls and it's going to get nuts and, you know, people are going to be more isolated and there's going to be more things happening and that. And I was, I said, you know, no, I don't think that's what's going to happen. It's going to get quiet for a while and things are going to. Um, everybody's going to be kind of like in this shock of whatever and that's kind of what happened and then um, which was good because I think it gave us all kind of time to prepare and adjust a little bit to what was about to happen and then I would say you know like early summer sometime around in there things like started picking up and picking up and picking up and then and then it got nuts um the numbers started really increasing. Um, it was really hard for staff. I, th I think the hardest thing was communication between the, our staff and the victims and communication between um, the victims and their community services and then our contact with community services. So until everybody figured out Zoom and you know doing everything virtually and where everybody was and people working from home and doing all that stuff um it was tough you know to get any kind of services for anybody because everything was shut down um and since then i think good things and bad things have come of it i mean i think there's a, definitely a need for more services and different um, from different directions, but I also think that there's been 
uh, growth in being able to have, like, just for example, like doing these kinds of meetings, you know, like there was never a time when all of us could have gotten together, pulled out of work, went somewhere, had a meeting, had these discussions, and then people in the public wouldn't be hearing it, you know, so like, it, this is this adapt adaptation has made things better where we can reach more people, I think, virtually than we were before. And, um, you know, that, that's a benefit. But some of our people who are serving don't have don't have access to that kind of stuff. So that's, again, something that makes it tough. So I think this is a continually evolving um, process that we're just going to have to keep working at. And it's, I think things are getting a little, a little easier, but um, with the COVID numbers rising now and everything, I think people are, uh, they're just, I think the need for shelters and safe housing is increasing and um, that more people who weren't so willing to reach out before are reaching out now. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm learning a lot from, from all three of you and I, I appreciate what you're sharing. I have, well, I have about 40 or 50 questions, but I'm, I'm gonna ask one more. <laughs> before I see if uh, our other guests on the call want to ask some. Uh, and the one, uh, the, the one more I'll ask is, so um, I, just before you came on, Jen, I, I led into that question about rates of, of domestic violence by saying that I get asked that a lot. Uh, friends and family members, especially who know the work I do, say, are you, are you seeing this a lot more? And I, I said, I think it's an important question. Um, but I'll, I'm also curious about what, what you three think might be some other important questions that aren't getting asked about how COVID is affecting um, people who use violence or people who survive it. And if there aren't any, there aren't any, but my, my experience is that people who work directly in the field usually um, know what people who don't work in it should be asking, but they aren't. So is there, is there something that people should be more curious about that they're, that they're not? Please, any, whoever wants to start, please go ahead. Chris, just to clarify, do you mean like when we make contact with a woman or she contacts us, are there more questions that we could be asking mm -hmm. her to fill in the gaps or? Yeah, that's, that a, that's a good question. I mean, um, when, whether it's reporters or people in the general public who, who don't, who know domestic violence is this thing that happens over there, but then work directly in it. When they're curious about how COVID is affecting people who use and survive violence. Um, my experience is that one of their first questions or their, their only question is usually, are you seeing more of it? Is it happening more? And I'm wondering if you think there are other aspects of how COVID is affecting domestic violence that folks who, who aren't experts in it um, should be thinking about and asking about. And if, if that's just a if that's just a stupid question, you can ignore it and talk about something else if you'd like to. I don't think it's a stupid question. I think what I would um, as as anytime that there's more issues that come up or somebody tries to have a resolution for some kind of problem that's happening, it seems like um, abusers always find a way to use that to their advantage. So I would say that this is another one of those situations where we're kind of seeing a lot of that. So whether it be taking advantage of the delay in court hearings or, you know, just taking advantage of a situation like well, you can't have any um, visits with your kids because of COVID. I mean, like, like it's just another thing that gets used um, against that person, another tactic, you know? So um, I, I guess I would just, if I was a person outside looking in and wanting to know those questions or, 
you know, wanting to know that information or just curious on how to help, I would just keep in mind that there's no one answer. There's no one way of abuse. Like there's, this is, um, this could be coming at a victim sideways from all directions, you know, so that whether it be like professional people in the community or friends or whoever, they really need to be aware of that and keeping that in mind when they're considering, you know, different resources or different, you know, ways to help. I just wanted to touch on your point about parenting. That has been an absolutely huge issue. And in the up and coming months, I would hope that the community thinks about these women who are suffering because the men have not, or the partners have not returned the children because of the pandemic, when it really has no, no roots in the pandemic, it has roots in power and control. Um, and that is the only reason why they're not returning the kids or they're making decisions without including the mom and saying it's related to the pandemic. And, and there's, there's, it's just, these women are so completely crushed when their partners are using this and they know, and they, and they know once they start recognizing the parts of domestic violence, they know what it is they can start to, you know, name it, but they can't, they're powerless to do anything about it. There's no resources in the community to go to, except maybe an attorney. And none of these women are really in a position through the pandemic to pay for more attorney expenses. So some of them are left, even though they're the primary parent, without this time with their children. These men have just made decisions. Yeah, and it really is uncharted territory, like Cammie said, about um, not having any kind of direction really about how this is going to impact um, kids in court orders later on and, um, and the lack of resources to take somebody to court if they are withholding um, because they're using COVID as a manipulation tactic. Um, so there's lots of barriers out there that people need to take into consideration. And another thing I think um, that individuals should be aware of in the community is that there's a lot of women victim survivors who are relying on some of these community resources to help their partner, their ex-partner, their father, their children, because they're in a position where, you know, their kids are going to see that person. And so, you know, the delay of receiving help or services, um, you know, it impacts their safety and it impacts uh, offenders ability to you know, get some help and rehabil rehabilitative programming. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I appreciate those responses. So we've got, uh, if we end when uh, the call is scheduled, Tim, we've got about seven minutes left. And I'm curious about whether anyone else who's on the call has questions for Cammie, Heather, and Jen. Go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask away or type a question into the chat box if you'd like to. I had a question of Chris and just wondering if you had an answer to your question about other questions that um, people should ask. I had a sense that maybe there's some that you think should be asked besides the other speakers. Um, I have asked questions like that in the past because I because I didn't want to share what what I was thinking. Um, but I, you know, I, I my experience tells me that um, unless someone has experienced uh, violence or worked with people who have experienced it, they're the questions they ask are different from if they work with people who are experiencing. So, like I said, while I understand the impulse to ask, is it happening? more often. Um, one of the reasons I was curious about Cammie's and Heather's and Jen's perspectives is that um, I was fairly certain they would identify the types of things they, they identified. That um, just COVID as a tactic in itself or as, uh, as access to other tactics to people who are, who are using violence. Um, I guess that uh, the question I, I think that needs to be asked more often by people who are attempting to understand violence is what are the lives 
what are the lives of people who are living through it like? Um, when I say people are living through it, I mean people who are surviving it. Um, that's it, It's really easy to focus on people who are using it. It's really easy to focus on um, policies and laws and legal responses, but I, I just don't think there can ever be enough focus put on what is it like for the people who have to who have to negotiate it and survive it and live through it. Thanks for that question. Anyone else? Austin, Christina, Jackie? Hi, um, I'm Christina. I am a reporter from Brute and I am working on a short 10 to 15 minute documentary um, where I'm really just in the research phase of uh, first it started with the Duluth model, but kind of looking at uh, domestic violence in general. And Chris, I think your question is so, so important of like, what are we not asking? Um, and I kind of wanted to follow up on your question and, and your, your response to the question, which is, do you guys have particular anecdotes that you can talk about that kind of exemplify the, the stresses that people are going through, like what their day-to-day -day life looks like? I know a couple of you brought up um, little bits and pieces here and there, but if you have kind of really strong anecdotes that stay in your mind that could help a general audience who's not familiar with domestic violence understand what it's like, would you be willing to share them? I guess I don't understand like what your question is. So you like what um, day to day like, life is like for somebody in a DV situation, living in a DV situation and now with COVID on top of it. Yeah, how, how it's, what it looks like with COVID, you know, whether it's um, someone living with the person that's battering them and trying to access these, these resources or the man trying to access these resources when he's living with the woman that he's battered before, or are the families separate? What What is it more likely? I know everybody's story is different, but more likely than not, what does it look like to be in this situation, whether you are the man who um, is seeking out resources or the woman? Do you have any like anecdotes that stick out in your mind from people that you've spoken with in the past few months? Here's just a thought. When we had surveyed the women whose partners were in the men's group, um, I mean, there's really no place for them to go while they were having group. And they were a lot of them in the same house. And we had to ask the question, would they, would they listen? Would they call? And if they heard their partner uh, telling or framing the situation in an untruthful way, would they call their partner out on it later? And these women, the majority of them said yes. And so that put them in an unsafe position. They, with the women, some of them who in particular had wanted to stay with the men uh, were the ones who had said that they certainly would call the men out, but that puts them in a really unsafe position. And the men too, because they don't have the place to discuss what they need to discuss. And it, it could be a dangerous situation. You know, I think like I mentioned earlier, you know, we've, we've talked a lot of victims who are figuring out safe ways to, to reach out um, and talk and doing that in safe ways. Um, and so, you know, just constantly thinking about is it safe for me to do now or me safe to do later is, you know, something victims are constantly processing in their heads when they're still um, in a home with their, with the person that uses violence against them. Um, I think there's that added dynamic of uh, when there's disagreements about how to parent right now because of COVID and the risks of that um, numerous individuals we've worked with uh, talk about how the violence has escalated because there's a disagreement about how they should parent or with schooling or um, limiting contact with people. Um, and so, you know, just figuring out how to co-parent, if that's even possible with, you know, in relationships where there's um, been violence, is, it's challenging already. So add that on top of it. Um, just this week, we talked to somebody who is 
um, still with their uh, abusive partner. And this person has been waiting for months to, to see a therapist and his appointment was canceled this week because of COVID related reasons. And that triggered a physical assault on her. And so, you know, all of these like little dynamics that are happening um, because of COVID like directly or, you know, have some kind of direct impact on a victim's safety. And I think that's, you know, can be forgotten about sometimes. Or, you know, we already have like the situations, like we all know, you know, before COVID, like daycare issues, financial issues, all of those things were things, you know, that a victim had to deal with um, and navigate around. And now, you know, more limited daycare situations and whatever. So maybe this person, you know, the abuser is their only daycare provider, you know, so then that just opens the door again, you know, to, you know, that's her only resource. So it's either that or don't work and then don't have money and then don't have housing, you know, so it's like this vicious cycle of, it's just exacerbating all the issues that are already there, you know, like they're her options or his options are limited and you know they really have to utilize what they can and do what they can you're t you're talking about people who are living in crisis and now they have a crisis on top of their crisis so it's um you know a, a lot of the women that i'm talking to are kind of either on autopilot like just mm, you know like just doing the day-to-day -day, you know getting through you know trying to survive or there's some pretty significant mental health issues happening now. Christina, thanks for that. Thanks for that yeah, question. Yeah, thanks for your answers. Thanks, Deborah, for their responses. Um, I want to honor uh, the time I asked people to spend. We're a couple minutes over. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop recording in a moment, but I just want to uh, say thank you very much uh, to everyone who showed up. Uh, both for your presence and for your insight, uh, Cami, Heather, and Jen. This is very helpful. Um, we'll be having another conversation uh, similar to this next week on Wednesday, December 9th at 2 o'clock. I'll be talking to Dean Olson and Steve Board from Herod Regional Corrections Probation about the work uh, they do um, both following up with people who have survived violence and supervising folks who have used it. Uh, and I know because I work closely with Steve that it's infinitely complicated uh, that work can lead him to some, um, some frustrating situations. So that'll be next week. Um, but thanks everyone for, for being here and uh, really appreciate your time.